Um, and something like this could happen to any of our horses at any time. And I think we should applaud Julie for certainly, and, and Team Tink for going the, the distance. But should this ever happen to you, you might be just thinking, what would I be able to do? And we thought that this would be a good year to bring you some information about equine insurance, which would enable you to um, do something like what Team Tink has done. And you know the warm feeling in your heart after hearing that, that, um, that story. And I think we have a wonderful person here this morning to tell you all about equine insurance because we have a true bluegrass blue blood. Sarah Hayes grew up on a prominent, a really prominent thoroughbred breeding farm and I would encourage you all to go to Google and read about this because it's really quite a story. It's a farm called Runnymede Farm, all in one, one word, R-U-N-N-Y-M-E-D-E, -E, and it's the oldest continuing running thoroughbred farm in Kentucky and Sarah told me that it wasn't even Kentucky when it started, it was part of Virginia and the same family is still running it, and she grew up there. Uh, they bred two derby winners, um, so many stakes winners you couldn't even count them, and Anglelite, one of only two horses that defeated Secretariat. Uh, he won the Wood Memorial back in 73, is that right? So that's her background. So she really knows horses. She grew up from a little, little kid in the falling st stall. Then, of course, where are you going to go to get educated except for University of Kentucky? And she'll speak very well to us because she has a degree in ag communications. Her original dream was to become a, a writer for the blood horse, but after spending time in the yearling business, she went to work in the insurance company because, insurance industry, because she really felt a calling there. She started in the office, but they saw that talent right away, and they pretty soon promoted her to the role of adjuster. Now it's 27 years later, and she is the chief claims manager for the equine and livestock division of XL Catlin. That's another thing to Google. That's quite a company. It's a global insurance company headquartered in Ireland. And we always think of insurance as where we buy our car insurance or our, our homeowners. Well, they're really affiliates of Lloyd's of London. Or, uh, what, they're similar to Lloyd's of London in that you can insure all kinds of odd things, um, like horses who do strange things. We're going to hear about those this morning. And they provide specialty insurance all around the world. Uh, she lives in Lexington. She has one daughter and three step stepsons, and her daughter is a professional event writer. And she's an expert in all things in equine insurance, and we're welcoming here her to talk this morning. Thank you. Sarah. I don't know if I can live up to all of that. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Ann and Amy, for inviting me. I really appreciate it. So, we, I, as you saw from Tinkerbell, horses can get hurt a lot. And I saw that Tinkerbell was insured with Hartford, so I hope you had a good claims experience. So that's very, very important. Um, if I can figure out how to do this. So, you want to get equine insurance, sorry. You probably don't even know where to begin. Most people don't. Um, it's very similar to buying your car insurance. You call an agent. And your agent is the person that is the go-between between you and your insurance company. Like, your car insurance might be through State Farm. Well, you don't call State Farm. You call your local agent to help you get the insurance coverage. It's the it's the same way with uh, equine insurance or horse insurance. You call your agent. They're going to ask you some questions. You're going to fill out some paperwork, which basically is an application, just with like you're applying for car insurance or horse insurance or in, any type of insurance, really. It's all pretty much the same because it's considered property. Horses are property, so you are inquiring about property insurance. Um, the agent who you talk to to buy the insurance then sends it to the insurance company. And most agents represent a multitude of companies and they will talk with you about what your needs are, what you, what you want out of your equine insurance, what you want it to do for you, and they'll try to place you with the best company that meets your needs. So they might quote it, um, you know, three different companies. Maybe 
one has a better rate in what you're interested in, one has better major medical coverage and you have a sport horse and that's very important to you, or you have a brood mare and their, their rates are better. So your agent is very important to you and, and they are, it's important to know that they are representing you and trying to get the best coverage that works for you because every situation is different, not everybody has the same needs. Um, so the agent submits your application to the underwriters. So that's the insurance company. And they're going to look at uh, the age of the horse, the sex of the horse, what's he used for. And that all goes into determining the price of your insurance. Um, these rates are filed. They, have, they can't just pick one out of the air. The underwriters don't just sit in their office and say, oh, I think I'm going to charge $500 for this policy. Because insurance, I don't know if you most people don't aren't aware of this is highly regulated in each state our policies are have to be filed with the department of insurance it has to be approved by the department of insurance and even our rates what we charge has to be uh, approved by the department of insurance and if we want to change those we have to give them a good reason why we can't just say oh we want to charge more because we're not making any money that would be nice but it doesn't work that way so the underwriters review all of the information, they look at your application, and they say, yes or no, we'll sell you a policy. Depending on your horse and the value of the horse, they may ask for a veterinary certificate, and some of you may have asked the vets at Genesee Valley to go out and do a vet certificate for your insurance. This typically only happens um, if a horse is at a certain value. For my company, it's horses over $100,000 or horses that have a history of uh, previous injuries or illnesses that we want to make sure they're recovered from. Um, and then there's the adjuster, that's me. And hopefully you don't ever talk to me, you don't want to talk to me, that means your horse is sick or injured or something's going on. I have lots of people tell me at the end of a claims process, I hope I never have to talk to you again. <laughs> so <laughs> that's okay, I can handle that. So. Um, sorry, I kind of got off track there. So why do you want to get insurance? It's different for a lot of people. Um, for me, it's my kid's horse. Um, I, I, can't not, I can't just go out and replace a horse if something happens to the one we have. And most people I find in my business, it is to, that they love their horse, they care about their horse, and it's, it's their family. There are also investment um, reasons to get insurance. We have lots of horses insured that it's a business. They're race horses, they're brood mares, they're stallions. Uh, but more often than not, it's policies that have one or two horses, they're part of the family, and that's just an extra layer of protection and peace of mind for the owners that they have something to fall back on if they have an injury like Tinkerbell's or, God forbid, their horse dies and they need to replace it, quite honestly. So um, the whole rule of insurance is to indemnify you, and that's to make you whole again, to make you uh, return to where you were when uh, the injury or the accident happened. There are many, many types of equine insurance, but almost all of them start with mortality coverage. Um, basically, mortality insurance is life insurance. It's life insurance for your horse. And it can um, cover a very wide range of... Oh, wrong one, sorry. Sorry about that. So these are just a very few of the things that a mortality policy would cover. Um, accidents, I mean, lightning strikes. Nobody ever thinks their horse is going to get struck by lightning, right? But it happens. We probably have 10 claims a year, maybe, for lightning strikes, um, which I don't know what the statistics are for horses getting struck by lightning, but it does happen. So. Um, you know, a trailer accidents, any kind of trauma, paddock accidents like Tinkerbell, you have no idea what happened. You walk out one day and there's your horse and he can't walk. So um, injuries, fractures, lacerations, pneumonia, colic, the list goes on and on about 
what these horses can do and we all have been there and know that it's um, possible and this obviously is not a comprehensive list I don't think I could make one on every kind of claim that we've had a mortality claim on horses that um, get injured or hurt the biggest thing to think about when you're insuring your horse for mortality is that it is life insurance it's not if your horse can show or race horses and if they can't race it is life insurance so you and I know nobody likes to think about their horse dying I mean none of us even want to go there or think about that but it, it does happen we all know that we all have pets and I don't know any horse people that don't have dogs so um, if that happens to you and your horse is insured for mortality insurance you have to have the insurance company involved in the process so if your horse has a severe injury and has to be euthanized or humanely destroyed because of the injury then that becomes a mortality claim um, so who decides that who decides if the horse is, is a candidate for euthanasia or humane destruction your veterinarian it's it's not our call we're not vets we don't we don't make the decisions so we would rely on Amy and Ann to tell us and we'll talk with them throughout the process of what has happened and sometimes it's a catastrophic event and they can't call us and that's totally fine too we're not gonna you know that's that happens but it's the attending veterinarians um, recommendation and it is important to note sometimes that uh, insurance companies will hire consulting veterinarians to work on their behalf that doesn't happen in every case it probably doesn't happen in 20 percent of the cases most things are very routine and but there are cases where we do have uh, the opportunity and re we request uh, a second opinion not that we're doubting your veterinarian because we're not we we would never would do that um, but just it may be that the horse is very expensive or it's a very unusual case that we haven't had any experience with and then we'll hire a consulting vet to work on our behalf we pay for that um, and most oftentimes the attending vets are quite welcome to that and uh, supportive of us hiring a, a second opinion um, and if the consulting vet agrees with the attending vets recommendation then that's that's it that's no problem um, we don't I, I would like to point out that and, and Amy said this last night when we were talking she said we have to get permission to euthanize a horse no you don't we cannot get permission to euthanize your horse that's not our job we, it's your horse you can do whatever you want to it's your horse but we have to be involved and we would agree to the vet's recommendation we are not giving permission to anything we that's not what we do and I think that's a, a big misunderstanding from the vets and the owners well I have to get permission you don't have to get permission but you have to be involved with your insurance carrier so they know what's going on and they can be informed of, of the decisions um, and the reason is it's a legal binding contract when you when you sent your check to to your agent to purchase that policy it became a legal contract between you and the insurance company and um, the policies are very nobody re, nobody wants to read their policy and probably not most people don't read their policies to be perfectly honest I couldn't tell you what my car policy says I have no idea but I can tell you what my horse insurance policy says um, but the, the insurance policies have very specific guidelines um, on what your responsibility is as an owner as an insured to protect your coverage under that policy in the same way we have very certain guidelines on what we can do and what our role is throughout the whole process of purchasing the insurance and filing a claim god forbid and i apologize for some of the pictures my assistant was quite excited to put in some gross pictures <laughs> so these are obviously just a few of the things that can and do happen to our poor horses I've, I've talked
talked a little bit about what is covered, there are some things that are not covered under mortality policy. Um, Pre-existing conditions. Um, let's, you have a horse that's had a severe injury and you, you've never had him insured before and you decide to get insurance. That injury is going to be pre-existing if something happens and God forbid he has to be euthanized or dies from that injury. A lot of, um, let's see. I don't know why she put intentional harm. Um, the policy requires that you need to provide proper care and attention at all times. And everybody says, well, of course I'm going to do that. Um, we only really see this on horses, well, one of the main examples, that say colic. And your vet is recommending colic surgery, or he's recommending, he or she is recommending referral to a surgical facility. And quite honestly, you can't afford that. Um, and you have to make an economic decision. And that's, again, it's your horse. You can do whatever you want with your horse. If you choose not to follow your veterinarian's recommendation, then you could have jeopardized your policy. Not always, it just, every case is different. But that's basically what that is uh, inferring, is that you follow your vet's recommendations. We really rely on the veterinarians. That's our our lifeline, so to speak, to, to your horse. Uh, we have to talk to them quite frequently about what's going on with your horse. Uh, some hereditary conditions aren't covered. Uh, at our company, we don't, uh, we don't cover HYPP. Um, but I'm sure there are companies that do. I don't know. And any medications, treatments prescribed, uh, or not prescribed, administered not by a veterinarian, that can be a problem. Not routine vaccinations, but if you are medicating your horse with, uh, without a veterinarian's advice or supervision and the horse has a reaction or has a problem, then you have a problem. Um, because we, you're not licensed to, to do that, first of all, and we don't feel it's uh, appropriate for owners to be administering medication to an insured horse without their vet's recommendations. Now, Amy comes and says she's okay, whatever, banamine twice a day, whatever. She feels like you're qualified enough to do that, that's good enough for us. So that's not a problem. I'm not saying you can never give your horse a shot, you can never give it a gram of butte or anything like that, but as long as the vet's involved, and if they're okay with it, we're okay with it. You know, it's the same with vaccinations. I mean, a lot of people vaccinate their own horses and that's totally fine, that's not a problem. <clears throat> Excuse me. Loss of use. Um, loss of use is a totally different type of insurance that is not life insurance. It's exactly what it says. It's to provide coverage for you if your horse can't do what you bought him to do. Let's say you bought a hunter jumper or a dressage horse and he has an injury that doesn't require euthanasia, but he can no longer perform. Um, if you have loss of use insurance, you may have a loss of use claim. They are very difficult, I will tell you, to prove and to determine if it is a permanent loss of use. It doesn't, it usually doesn't provide the level of performance. So if you've got a Grand Prix jumper and he can't do that anymore, but he can still do, you know, the lower levels, that's not a loss of use. So it's quite expensive. Um, we don't sell it. There are many companies that do sell it, and I'm not trying to sell you anything. Um, but it is out there, it is available, and if it's something that's important to you, I, you know, I would suggest you look into it. So we've got just a little bit about claims, and I'll talk more about that later. But um, the biggest thing, and I talked earlier, is about to, to notify us. Your policy, one of those important guidelines that's listed in your policy is immediate notification. And uh, what does that mean? Well, immediate has a wide range of what it can mean. <laughs> so immediate could be 3 o'clock in the morning when your horse is colicking, or it could be the next morning, that's okay too. But uh, the issue is we need to be notified of what is wrong with your horse. We, we like the rule of thumb, if you call your vet, you need to call your insurance company. Now, 
are you going to call for every runny nose, every eye discharge? No, that would be crazy. I would be on the phone 24 hours a day and everybody would be frustrated, trust me. <laughs> so, but if it's, a, if it's something that's significant or that your vet is treating your horse for, you need to call your insurance carrier. And what happens more often than not is Friday afternoon at four o'clock, I'll get a call, my horse is lame. Well, how long has you been lame? About three weeks. <laughs> so, well, okay. <laughs> how bad is it? Well, you know, we didn't think it was any big deal, but it was just an abscess, and we've been soaking it, and the vet's been out, but now they think it has laminitis. So what was a simple, you know, my horse is sore, my horse is lame, has now turned into a life-threatening condition. Um, and it's, it happens all the time. And no, nobody's saying you did the wrong thing, you treated the horse appropriately, but we need to be involved in that um, conversation with your veterinarian about what is happening and, and what's going on with your horse. You're probably wondering why do we need to be involved. Um, again, we might hire a consulting veterinarian to, and again, this is all on our dime, to um, help with the the decision making process. I'll, I'll have a case that we recently had that's fairly unusual. Um, we had a racehorse that had a history of a post joint injection edema. They called us, they said the horse is sound, it's not a problem, he's still in training. Okay great, and it was an expensive racehorse. We didn't even open a claim file on it. They had notified us, they had adhered to their policy guidelines. Eight weeks later we get a call, this horse needs to be euthanized. <laughs> I'm like, why? He's got a joint infection, he's had an arthroscopy, We've, we can't figure out what's going on, he's incredibly lame, on and on and on. So um, I said, well, would you, you know, please send me the x-rays. The attending vet was quite happy to do that. Sent us the x-rays, we in turn had the x-rays reviewed by an orthopedic surgeon. The orthopedic surgeon thought it was a totally different condition, uh, not a joint infection. We chose to pay for the horse to go to another surgeon. We paid for it. Um, the horse had surgery, had a cyst drilled in his pastern. He's completely sound. He's probably going to return to racing. And it was a win-win situation for everybody. The owner had spent a lot of money trying to take care of this horse. So, and the horse was a euthanasia candidate because he was quite lame and had been chronically lame for about six weeks. Um, so we saved a lot of money. The insurance company didn't pay a large claim. When I say large, I mean mid six figures. Um, and the horse, still, or the horse is happy, sound. The owner still has a racehorse. So that is a really good example of why we want to be involved. And it was no fault of anybody's. The veterinarian did not had never seen the condition before, so they had no idea. So it was just one of those things that turned out really well. It could have turned out the other way. The orthopedic surgeon could have said, yes, he needs to be put down, and that would have been, you know, a whole other story would have gone the other way, and it would have been a valid mortality claim. So immediate notification is super important for, for those reasons, and um, it's just in your best interest as a horse owner, we might know, you know, we might know a vet that has handled something um, that your vet doesn't know about. I mean, we're not trying to tell you how to do your jobs, trust me. We, that's not our job. Um, I call vets every day and ask questions because I don't have a clue. I learn something every day about what, something. But, um, so we just need to be notified. Or we, every insurance carrier needs to be notified about what's going on with your horse. And again, that's to protect you as an insured in case a claim arises later on down the road. Okay, so I saw that Tinkerbell was insured through Hartford, so I'm sure you had major medical coverage. I hope you had a good experience. Good. So, um, major medical coverage. That's what's important to so many people um, that have performance animals, athletic or uh, uh, sport horses. We, we don't, nobody that I know writes major med on race horses. I think you can understand why. <laughs> because we would all be out of business. Uh, we know the vet care that races, race horses require. So um, there's 
every insurance company has a different version of medical insurance. It, um, you have to buy the mortality policy, policy in order to be um, to get the major meds, excuse me. And every insurance carrier, it's a little bit different. So that's where your agent really comes into play in this process, determining what coverage is best for you. Um, some have, some pay 100%. Some have a co-insurance. Some have a lameness co-insurance. Our company right now has a 60% lameness co-insurance. Um, some have co-insurance on diagnostics, and as you know, that can be quite expensive. The diagnostics, the MRIs, the um, the bone scans, the X-rays, the blocking, all of that, especially in a lameness condition, working up a, a lameness condition, quite expensive, um, very quickly. So major medical, and also is designed to cover major, major illnesses. When this coverage was uh, first started about 25 years ago by a domestic company, Great American Insurance, they thought, oh, it'll be a great idea for us to give our horse owners some medical insurance. Little did they know <laughs> what they were getting into. And at that time, it was designed for colic surgeries, pneumonias, severe trauma accidents. It has since evolved into a product that is more um, applicable to what we do with our horses today. Uh, some policies cover rehab, some policies cover acupuncture, chiropractic, ours do not. But it just depends on what you need and what, um, what is best for you and your horse and what your horse is used for. Most of them don't cover routine maintenance, joint injections, um, vaccination, things like that. I mean, everybody we know has their hawks injected once a year or whatever. So uh, sadly, nobody covers that for me either. I wish they did. But um, it covers a wide variety and it varies widely by your insurance carrier. That happens to be my horse with a sternum laceration. <laughs> so. That was a major med claim going over a cross country jump. So, these are just a few of things that can happen. You know, the basket surgery is a wobbler, obviously, if you don't know what that is. Eye conditions, colic surgeries, fractures, you name it, we see it every day. Um, I'm, every day I'm amazed at what our horses can get into. Uh, I think I, I can't be surprised anymore, and I always am, trust me. So if you have a major med claim, um, you call your insurance company adjuster agent. Your agent can report it to the company. Um, the adjuster will speak with your veterinarian about what's going on with the horse. We will send a a vet report request to your veterinarian and ask them to fill it out about the particulars of the case, what's happened, what medications the horse is on. Um, you probably don't want to keep looking at that, sorry. Um, and that's not even that's not even better, is it? <laughs> so, but we're, we're dealing with your veterinarians to uh, figure out what's going on with your horse and use it's a very simple process or it should be a very simple process I'll say where you send in your vet bills um, we get a vet report we reimburse you for the cover charges um, and it could it could go on like Tinkerbells I keep using Tinkerbell thank you um, for a long time um, it like she was in the hospital for a week or a month, I guess, and uh, so it could be a process that that takes a little while to get through. And um, we can send multiple checks. We don't have to wait till the very end. We don't, uh, you know, we we can pay the vet clinic direct most of the time if you request that. Just we try to really work with the client on what's best for them and what suits their needs. Um, I, I, what we can't do is we can't give you a deposit when you go to Cornell. Uh, we can't, you know, we can't pay Cornell their deposit or wherever, and that that becomes hard for some people. I know if your horse is admitted to a clinic and they want your credit card, but um, the major med definitely helps with those expenses, and it's being educated on what your policy covers, so you won't be surprised during a claim process. Well, you know, why didn't I get more, or why why didn't it? Uh, pay for more of that. I think Major Med is the best thing ever. I have it on both of my horses. I have filed multiple claims and uh, no, it doesn't pay for everything. 
it's not very expensive, I don't think, but you're sure glad you got it when, when you need it. Um, I don't ever want to look at my daughter and say, we can't afford colic surgery. So uh, that's, that's why I have it, uh, just personally. So that's major med coverage. Emergency colic surgery is just what it says. Um, it's just for colic surgeries. Quite often, it's a free product that you don't even pay for. Um, it's attached to your mortality policy. Thoroughbred racehorses can have this. They do have this. Um, it's one of the few medical coverages that a racehorse will have. And I say thoroughbreds, so it's not just thoroughbreds. It could be standard reds, quarter horse racers, whatever. Um, it's not a lot of money. It's usually $5,000, which that is a lot of money for me. Um, but a colic surgery can be quite expensive. And it um, may or may not be, you may be able to have colic surgery and major med coverage. There are companies that are going to that, so you'll have an extra layer of protection if your horse has a colic surgery. I recently had a claim on this poor mare that had two colic surgeries within two weeks. So um, the good news is she delivered a happy, healthy baby two days ago. She had, her colic surgeries were about eight weeks ago. Um, and she, she spent every dime of her major med and her emergency colic surgery. But she's, she's thrilled. She's got a brand new, beautiful cold, uh, colt to show for it. This is a, a coverage that a lot of people aren't aware of. It's called prospective foal insurance, and it's insuring your unborn foal. So you've purchased a mare out of a sale that's pregnant, or you finally have enough money to breed to that stallion you always wanted to. You want to ensure that investment, um, that unborn foal is very important to you. And most people, not a lot of people that buy this coverage are, are breeders. And, and they're running a business and they're trying to protect their investment. Not only their stud fee, but they're protecting their future earnings when they sell that animal at a yearling sale or a two-year-old sale or, or whatever. So typically uh, the underwriters, um, if a horse, if a mare's purchased at public auction, then part of that purchase price will be applied to the unborn foal insurance and part mortality for the mare. If you've bred to a stallion, typically um, the underwriters will allow two and a half to five times the stud fee to protect, because you're not just protecting that stud fee, you're protecting what happens down the road after your, you know, two years of investing in this animal and then some, you know, you don't have it to sell. Um, doesn't cover uh, twins. So when you request prospective foal insurance, the mare I think has to be either 42 or 45 days pregnant. She has to be confirmed pregnant by a manual palpation and two ultrasounds. So, and that's something that obviously we have to get from the veterinarian. And these are the good ones. See, these babies lived. They were probably premature in the NICU. This, uh, probably nobody's heard of, um, this is called accident, sickness, and disease infertility coverage, obviously for stallions. Um, this is to protect your stallion in the event that he can no longer do his job. Um, we want him to be, do his job. Um, if he can't do his job, it has to be the result of an accident, a sickness, or disease. That's the name. So we have an aging stallion, has low sperm count, and he, he can do his job, but he's not getting the job done. Um, that probably, that's not a mortality claim because the vet can't tell us why. He, maybe it's just he's gotten older uh, and he just, he just can't do it. So these really are designed to cover horses that have a specific injury. We see this a lot in um, stifle injuries, hawks where the, the stallion can no longer mount the mare. It is almost always thoroughbred coverage. Um, we have had some quarter horses. Uh, the horse on the left is probably the most famous ASD claim ever in the history of insurance. That's Cigar. I don't know if you remember Cigar when he was racing. It's rumored that claim was upwards of $40 million. So he never 
never had an offspring. He lives at the Kentucky Horse Park um, and quite expensive for the insurers, let me tell you. The right is American Pharaoh. I'm sure you've all heard of him. I promise you he has infertility coverage somewhere in the market. We don't have it, thank goodness, uh, because it would be quite, quite expensive. Um, so in cases like American Pharaoh and uh, Cigar, those would have been claims that occurred the first season that they stood at stud. That's a little bit different type of coverage. It's called first season infertility, and that is exactly what it says to cover them that very first year if they cannot, if, if if they're not proven breeders. And um, that coverage is quite expensive. It is um, on almost every thoroughbred colt that's running in the Kentucky Derby or races like that um, to protect that investment later on. So we'll see these, um, these, these thoroughbred colts that are on the Derby Trail, we call it. Um, and their owner knows that they're going to win the derby and they're going to be the next secretariat. But um, so they'll have the mortality coverage and they'll have the uh, first season infertility or ASND coverage to protect them. There's a couple of other, other coverages that I didn't put up here because quite honestly I forgot because we don't see them very often. Um, for older horses there are coverages called a special accident. and. Um, Usually mortality coverage ceases at anywhere between 18 and 20, 20 years old. And our horses can live a lot longer than that, and they do thanks to our great vet care, right? So a special accident policy will cover uh, an external accident in case um, something happens to your horse. I had a claim the other day in, uh, out west during the blizzards of power line fell on a horse and killed him instantly. So that would, and it was a special accident policy, so that is a covered loss under that policy. Um, we also have, or we, meaning the insurance uh, world, has policies that are called specified perils. This is really only designed to cover um, fire, lightning, and transportation. It's quite inexpensive. We see it a lot in large farms that just want a, a small layer of protection for their not they're lesser valued animals. They'll do like a herd policy um, because if you have, I mean, we wrote insurance for, I think I can say this, Windstar Farm. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Windstar, but there's 500 horses on their policy. So you can imagine what the premium is. Um, it, it's quite expensive. And, and at some point you can't insure everything. You have to say, uh, well, I have to take my risk and and see what happens. So just a few reminders about filing a claim and what, what is important. Um, always report the loss immediately to, and you can call your agent. If you know, if you go to dinner on Friday nights with your insurance agent, call them. They're, that's what they're there for. And they'll call the insurance company. Um, our adjusters and every insurance company that I know of has adjusters on call 24-7. Christmas Day, Thanksgiving Day, every day, 3 o'clock in the morning. So, and we, that's our job. And we get calls all the time and we're happy to take those calls and um, be there for you when you are upset and your horse is colicking or has had an injury and you're in the trailer and, and traveling somewhere. So, that's very important that you call us. If, God forbid, your horse dies or has to be euthanized, the policy does require a necropsy, which is a post-mortem exam. Uh, depending on the circumstances regarding, uh, surrounding the loss, um, let's say you, you come out one day and your horse is just dead. You have no idea, no history of illness, no, anything. It's better at that time for those horses to go to a diagnostic lab or a university for their necropsy. That's not always feasible. And that's when we would ask you to call your local, your attending veterinarian to come out and, and do that for, for us. And it's part of the policy requirements. Nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to do it. But it is a requirement of the insurance. Um, there are some exceptions if a horse has a fracture that's quite obvious. That's it. The, you know, all the, I tell people all the time, take a picture. You know, send me a picture, a photograph of what, what has happened. 
then, you know, just follow, it's, it's very common sense, follow your vet, vet's recommendations. Um, and again, we are, we are quite happy and do talk to the vets on almost every case. And if I could say one thing to you, read your policy. <laughs> read your policy. Because um, you might not know that we don't cover joint injections or, you know, any number of things. Be proactive. I'm sure you, you sort of know what's covered under your homeowners and you probably sort of know what's covered under your car insurance. But um, just read your policy. Ask questions. I have people call all the time, would this be, hypothetically, would this be covered? Would that be covered? And we're always happy to answer those questions, always. Um, so that's kind of it in a nutshell. Questions, anyone? Do we have, do we have time? <laughs> yeah. It, it would make sense to you if you saw our actuarial numbers. Um, no company makes money on major medical. We, lo we lose a lot. Of, we couldn't charge a high enough premium to cover the risk. So I am just being perfectly honest. And, yeah, but, and we are a company. We are there to make money. We're not there to deny claims. I promise you that. If I hear it, you just don't want to pay my claim. No, I do want to pay your claim because it's a lot easier for me to pay your claim than not pay it. But that's it. I mean, we just cannot make any money selling major med. Major med is a flat fee. It's not determined on your insurance. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Some people do actually do that. Well, the re the way we do it is we're not going to give you ten thousand dollars in major med unless you pay unless you get ten thousand in mortality. I mean, you may have a you may have a horse that's worth a hundred thousand dollars, and only because you just want that major medical, and and we understand that. But we're not the major med limit is not going to be more than the mortality, and we find that major med does encourage people to be proactive in the care of their horses, and that's that's what we like. Um, but it is a service. It, it's a it's a service that we provide. We don't make any money on it. I mean, we just we just don't. But everybody wants it, and most people have it. I don't know if the rest of you heard. The question has to do. The big Why part of the question. The last question was, how do we value the horse? How do we come up with a value on a given horse? And that's you're saying that's somewhat up to the owner to decide. Yeah, it's um, on these bigger horses. I imagine though, there's a little more involved. It, it is involved, and in the and the underwriter will review that yearly. Um, if it's a newly purchased horse, it's going to be purchase price. Um, if it's a race horse, those are fairly easy because um, they race earnings. It's a lot harder on performance horses, I think. We, we the underwriters, not me, it's not my decision. Um, they'll look at show records. Sometimes we get trainer statement. What, um, what kind of training, what level are they doing? I know some companies rate in eventing different rates for prelim and above and prelim and below. So it, a lot just depends on what your horse is doing at the time that you take out the insurance. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, kind of on that same subject then, if you only spend, say, $6,000 on a really good trail horse, that's mm -hmm. all you do with them. But you want to make sure you have enough money to do what you did with Tink or something like that. Mm -hmm. Did you then take a major medical out and say your horse is worth ten thousand? How do you how do you do that? Well, you can. <laughs> um, in the application process that you complete when you're um, purchasing your insurance, it's going to ask you the acquisition price, and it's going to ask you how long you've owned the horse. If you just purchased it, it would be unusual that they would allow a, a higher value on an insurance policy. But if you've had that horse for a couple years and 
and his value has increased. I mean, we're really going to leave it up to the owner and the agent to determine the value of the animal. Um, and it's not, it's not unusual for horses to be increased each year as they do more things, especially, um, but even a trail horse, that's, it, it's valuable to you. You can't replace that horse for what you bought it as, and we understand that, and the underwriters understand that. They will ask why, and they, it may be simple as an email explaining what your horse has done in the training and, you know, things like that, but it is possible and it happens every day to increase the value. If you actually purchase the insurance, say you purchase um, with the horse valued at $10,000 and the horse passes away, do they actually pay the 10000 or do they reevaluate what the value, no, the value no, no, was no, no, at no. that point? No, 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 no. Most, if not all, policies are agreed value, meaning yes, we will pay what the insured value is. Now, there's always a caveat to that. Um, and the only reason would be you were dishonest on your application. Because um, we do ask you to provide proof of the acquisition. If you have a claim, we're going to ask you for your bill of sale or cancel check. Not everybody has those things. But we need some documentation to support that purchase price. Um, and that's what the adjusters do in the claims process. If you, um, if you wrote on your application that you paid 8000 but you really only paid five, and the horse died, and we, in the claims process, found out that you only paid five, we're only going to pay you five. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. If it's a baby, we might ask for a stud fee um, or a breeding contract. Uh, that happens a lot. Or you might not even have one. You might own the mare and the stallion both, and this is a, an individual that you've trained, and it has a job now, and then that's that's t perfectly fine too. That's where you, excuse me, you're just going to have to tell us that during the claims process that it was a homebred and um, that's, that's not a problem at all.